All right. He is a multi Emmy nominated writer, co creator of the hit TV series Lopez, Silicon Valley, and History of the World. He's also working on the, uh, the more recently, The Freak Brothers on Tubi. In 2007, he co wrote the film that brings us together today, Blades of Glory. Thank you so much, uh, Dave, Krins- uh, Dave Prinsky, for being here today. What, what, I'm sorry, what are you doing? Oh. Okay. Thank okay. You. All right. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank, thank you. Thank you. And also, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I'm looking at you right now. You are a dead ringer doppelganger for Whiplash. I'm getting uh, real Ricky. Whiplash. Yes. Is it free? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah I can Have you see never that. gotten that before? No, but I've gotten a lot worse. My wife oh my is like, like Paul Giamatti, who oh I love God. as a manager, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not like that's the. Oh I'm not going to say any more, you know. All right, we'll jump right into it. Now, let's, hey, listen, the reason why you're here, of course, is Blaze of Glory, but let's start before we get there. Let's go right into, you met your writing partner, John Altshuler, at uh, attending UNC, where you guys were uh, credited with the first student-produced comedy show on their student television before becoming writers for National Lampoon Magazine. Can you tell us about that time there and the role it played in shaping the approach to comedy? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I had always wanted to be a writer since I was probably about 12, but I pictured myself more as a, uh, you know, serious novelist. And so I went to Carolina and I was taking all the writing classes and, um, you know, all the short story classes. And there were great professors there, but I never knew what to write about. I was like, you know, everybody's writing these heavy things. And I was like, ah, sounds pretentious. I don't even know what to write. I wish I could do that. And so I started just trying to write funny stuff. I always liked Saturday Night Live and Monty Python. So I just kind of would whip out funny short stories. And you know, most people would be, well, it was entertaining. A couple would be snarky and go, uh, you know, criticizing it on all these esoteric levels. But, you know, I had a great professor who kind of knew what I was trying to do and just was like, okay, if you're trying to be funny, do this, do that. So I kind of had my my headspace into comedy. And then my roommate was like, oh, you got to meet this guy, John Altshuler. He's in one of my classes. He's super funny. Um, so we met and we hit it off. And yeah, we, this, the student run STV that had just started some guys when you had started it up and John and I and this other guy, David Palmer, all decided, you know, we had the same background, Saturday Night Live, SCTV, things like that, decided, hey, let's try to do our own sketch comedy show. So it wasn't easy. They had one camera, one editing bay. But the, the thing that I learned very quickly was things that you may think are funny on the page when an actor has to say them out loud. You know, if it's a mouthful, if the rhythm's off, whatever, it doesn't work. So I quickly learned, you learn a lot what works and what doesn't work simply by you know, producing the show and, and having actors have to say, including ourselves. I'm sorry. How, how do you get around something like that? Like once you, when you realize that that's, cause that's, that's why I've, I've written a, a, like a comedic screenplay and shot it a few times. And I've ran into that same thing. I'm curious, like when you, when you have that realization, how do you shift the approach to, to make that work? Well, it's definitely a, 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 an evolution. You know, you can learn it. At, you can recognize the mistake and not be able to fix it for a while. Um, so a lot of it's just repetition. But I think the main thing we learned, especially when we started doing like King of the Hill and other, you know, longer form stuff is you can't ask a line or a scene to do too many things. If they're trying to carry double duty or triple duty, you know, the, the humor is going to get lost. So you've got to be clear um, and you've got to be simple. Um, and I think from hearing lines read that where you recognized you were trying to do too much was the, the sort of education we needed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think the experience is a big part of it. Um, problem is that really good actors can sometimes, you know, cover your mistakes, which is nice. They can pull off a line you didn't think they'd be able to. But, you know, in general, you're going to hear how it doesn't work and how it doesn't play and figure out a way to fix it. Yeah, I'd imagine if... Um if like Christian Bale was the only actor that was getting cast in the films that you were writing, you could probably go your whole career without realizing you're a bad writer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Exactly. So, I mean, King of the Hill was a great example. Those actors were so phenomenal. They saved us so many times when, you know, as a writer, sometimes, you know, you're kind of spackling over something and you, and you hope for the best. And, and those guys were able to always sort of make us look good. So. Yeah. Goddamn Bill. I love Bill. <laughs> um, your first credit, and this is according to IMDb, so uh, we always be sure to say that, was in uh, 1988 as a production assistant on uh, Torch Song Trilogy. And I bring that up because that film was written by and starred Harvey Firestein, who, of course, was the antagonistic Parade of Hope president in Death to Smoochie. 
that's a smoochie actually ended up being a factor and why we're why we're speaking today. Um, I say all that to ask this from a comedy writer's perspective, what makes that death to smoochie work in your opinion? Well, I, I'm probably a little biased, but to me, it's all Adam Resnick who wrote the screenplay. Um, Adam was my first boss. I worked on a TV show that he created called The High Life, which was on HBO that no one really saw was sort of before they were HBO. But um, David Letterman was the executive producer. Adam had been the uh, sort of head writer for Letterman for many years. Um, and his screenplay was just so funny. He actually, he had written a screenplay before. I mean, he'd written Cabin Boy with Chris Elliott, which some people love and other people you know, love to get the knives out on. Yeah. Um, I loved it. Uh, and he wrote another one called Numbers, which became the movie Lucky Numbers with John Travolta and Lisa Kudrow, I think, and Nora Ephron directed that. And that was one of those things where, look, Nora Ephron, obviously legendary director, but Adam's screenplay was not what got shot. His screenplay was brilliant. And that was sort of the same thing. I think Danny DeVito did a great job with Death to Smoochie. But for me, honestly, it's just like knowing Adam wrote that and, and sort of hearing him in all the lines is what makes it entertaining for me. Yeah, I like getting to see the the Robin Williams that I was used to seeing on stage, but rarely in film. Getting to see that Robin Williams let loose in a film it was yeah, wonderfully dark. I'm gonna go watch some of our episodes on that because that, that was a great discussion. Now, it's the years around ninety seven, ninety eight. I'm a freshman in high school, but it's you, Jerry Springer, and I say you because you actually start writing on a show that carried me through most of my years of high school, which is King of the Hill, as you mentioned earlier. Now, you would ultimately become an executive producer for the series. Now, again, I'm geeking out on you because you, I, I, I'm now I'm going back asking myself how many lines did I laugh at that he wrote. So this is a nostalgia moment for me right here. So this seems to be the beginning of a long working relationship with you and Mike Judge with, with collaborations on projects like The Good Family, Extract, which we will talk about, uh, the Beavis and Butthead reboot, and more recently, Silicon Valley. Now, can you tell us about that relationship and what keeps bringing you guys back together to collaborate? Yeah, I mean, we were uh, we came into King of the Hill sort of at the very beginning of the second season, the first season had just started airing since it's animation. It's such a long process. Um, so the original, you know, group of writers was there and we were the first hires in. Um, and we had seen Beavis and Butthead and, you know, we're huge fans of, of Mike's already. And yeah, you know, when we met him, there was just a sort of, you know, there was, we had a lot of similarities. There were nothing against Harvard. You guys went there. There were a lot of Harvard guys there. Mike's not a Harvard guy. We weren't Harvard guys. Um, you know, his, his father was uh, like an archaeologist, anthropologist. John Ultra's father was an anthropologist. So, and we both were like, as John likes to say, we both had this, we all had the stink of the middle class on us. We were just sort of, you know, middle class kids who came out there, didn't really know anybody and had managed to, you know, Mike obviously very successfully, you know, get started in Hollywood. So we kind of had a lot in common. I think our humor was similar. Um, and as, you know, the show evolved and we became showrunners, I think, you know, we had a shorthand because of the similarities, but I think we also, you know, just always listen to him because he's, Mike's a, can be a quiet guy and he's not, he's not a swinging dick. I can say that on this podcast, right? Yes, you can. <laughs> Swing that dick. Go ahead. All right. Um, you know, but he, look, he's a genius. He knows what he wants. And so we were always like, that's a great resource. Let's use it. So we were always like listening to Mike. Um, and so I think we just sort of developed a very close relationship there. Um, so when they, sort of as we moved on and we would have ideas or he would have ideas, we'd always just kind of bounce them off each other. And we just found ourselves saying, yeah, let's, let's do that together. Let's do that together. So, you know, it's just been very fun and rewarding to work with that guy. That's cool. You say like you had like this, the, the, the middle-class stench on you or whatever, because in, in a lot of your works, the collaborative collaborations and like office space from King of the Hill and, um, uh, 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 extract they all have this authenticity to like the nuances of the middle class experience just like the little things that you could only really know if you're if you lived it even for a moment yeah and i think that that authenticity comes through and, it, and it's even a part of you know blades of glory which we'll talk about a little later as crazy and wild as it was you know our goal was to make it feel as real as we could so king of the hill i think you know, like what was great about it was the people on the coast thought we were making fun of middle America and people in middle America sort of thought we were making fun of the coast, but they recognized we were also making fun of them, but in a way that we recognized because it was authentic. Yeah. So, you know, that authenticity, I think, is what, you know, is what audiences were attracted to. Yeah, for sure. I love it. 
because yeah, you don't you you get you don't really get that much on television. Like uh, a lot of the times, the middle class experience is used as the punchline. I mean, I would not know about a neurourethra if it was not for King of the Hill. As well. <laughs> yes, we do a lot of good uh, medical work too. Yes, <laughs> and that uh, you know, ass, no ass syndrome and the neurourethra. So you know. Thank God to work there. There you go. All right. Blades of Glory appears to be your first feature film credit. It was shot in 2006, released in 2007, co-written with Jeff and Greg Cox. When did the writing take place for that? And how did you and John get involved with the production? So the Cox brothers had sold it as a spec screenplay before we were ever involved. So we didn't even know them. Um, And they sold it to Red Hour, which is Ben Stiller's company. And Ben had bought it you know, for himself to star in. And we got called, you know, Ben actually did King of the Hill sort of as a favor to Mike Judge. And I think he was a little uh, hesitant to do it, but he came in and did the table read and he played a great role. He played like a new employee of Strickland Propane, who was a guy who was always like, that's what she said. And everybody thinks he's so funny and driving Hank nuts. And Ben, you could tell, you could tell he walked in because, you know, our actors are very good. And you tell maybe he's like, didn't know what he was getting into. And he had a blast and he did wonderfully. And after that, I think he was looking for people to rewrite the movie. And Mike had said, oh, you got to talk to these guys. So we got a call. Our agent said, oh, they're looking for like a three week rewrite on this movie. And we're like, that's great. That's great work. And I think Ben was producing the Tenacious D movie. And we went over to the set. I met with him and Stuart Kornfeld, his producing partner. And we said, look, honestly, guys, this is a this is a could be a great movie. There's a lot of good in the script, but we think it's bigger than a three week rewrite personally we just felt like while it was a funny setup and and the character said funny things that the underpinnings needed to be very real and authentic and and all we said we think it's a slightly bigger rewrite and we thought we had talked ourselves out of a job but by the time we got back our agent called and said yeah they want you to do it so we went in and did the rewrite um and once again look it's a it's a great idea for a movie it's a it's a great title i think it was the first script the cox brothers had had written. So I think it just needed some of the, you know, some of the work that we'd been doing on King of the Hill, rewriting hundreds of scripts, you know? Um, so we, you know, did a draft, you know, with Ben sort of input and, um, and he just really loved it and said, yeah, I want to do this. And we are like, you know, great. And we, we had a table read and um, Ben played, Chaz and and John Heater was involved and and the director Speck and Gordon were were already on board and it was a great table read. Um, it was uh, it wasn't the the same cast. I think Zoe Deschanel played Jenna Fisher's role at the table read and see that. Uh, Alec Baldwin played Craig T. Nelson's role. Um, yeah, that's yeah, uh, it, that's that's interesting to come into a like. Uh, was it was that something I know you did that you say you did it on King of the Hill but was um was that like the first sign that you've like come into a feature film like that and and worked on a script that already had like a foundation laid out no we had done several feature rewrites previous to that nothing that had gotten produced um but I mean obviously writing movies is a little different from writing tv but the our, our philosophy toward rewriting was always the same which is let's keep as much as we can keep and you know change what has to be changed um and in this one yeah it was uh we'd done it a bit before and we kind of relied on what we knew what we felt you know a, a movie needed to sustain itself over that and a lot of it was the characters you know they had to have backstories they they had to you know be unique and identifiable have their own you know idiosyncrasies and their interplay had to mm-hmm. you know be specific and you know, like John always says, we we treat like these guys thought they were in an opera. You know, we had them being so serious, never winking at the camera when we wrote it. Like they had to take everything super serious. This was life and death because the comedy was going to take care of itself. You know, two guys yeah. skating together. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was that was one of the funniest things to me about it was the absurdity of the situation of juxtaposed with the seriousness that they were approaching the, the like Will Ferrell's just deadpan delivery when he's when he's you know beautifully skating around the ice and it's just done so well. Uh it, was that was that a part of the original script that you guys walked into? Was it it leading to a male male figure skating duo the like the first of its kind like that was it just an issue of it not setting that up believably enough to for the payoff yeah i mean the core 
idea of two guys skating together was there. And, and I remember the, you know, the Koch brothers did a very nice job with that scene where, where the coach is watching the video of them getting arrested and being inspired to, to come up with the idea. But yeah, I mean, I think what, what had happened was, you know, in Hollywood as always happens, once the movie got green lit, you know, they brought in a bunch of other re writers to punch it up. And then we get a call saying, hey, can you guys come back on this? Because as the head of DreamWorks City was now, I, I feel like I've got two angry stand-up comedians hurling insults at each other. And I think, you know, the, they'd gotten away from, uh, you know, making it a character-based, as silly as it is, it had to be a character-based story and for people that don't care. There's a sweetness to it that was like Will Ferrell is it was playing his like alpha male type of person and John Heater is playing a similar character to what what people are used to seeing him as. But it was something weird about Blades of Glory that made it really special because there was no like there wasn't any animosity or it was just a very sweet natured movie. Yeah. And I think a lot of that did come from John and from Will, who are both, you know, extraordinarily nice guys. And you can watch Will Ferrell being a dick because you know he's not, you know, that, yeah. that comes through. And, and John is just super sweet in real life. And and that comes across as well. Now, I um I so I know you guys came in after the the brothers were at the original draft, but you you still you collaborate often with uh, John Altshuler. And I've I've written in collaborative environments before, and it seems like there's no getting around the necessity to compromise at, at least here or there. Uh, and I've been in situations where like I could admit that the best idea made it to the page, even if it wasn't my idea. But there have been times where, in hindsight, I look back and I wish that I had not compromised. Is there? Anything that that comes that comes to mind, like you, for that, or um, or just how do you how do you navigate those situations when you're in the writing room? Yeah, look, it, it's definitely difficult. We all have have egos. Um, I think you know, just sort of anecdotally, there there were a couple of guys that ran King of the Hill, and and they were a team, and their sort of philosophy was that if they both didn't find something funny, it didn't go in the script, hmm. and you know, which is. I guess perfectly valid, but we spent a lot of time, you know, there's the King of the Hill writers can, you know, Oh, he merged nicely. That's a line you say to any King of the Hill writers there, they're going to go, Oh God, because it was a line we pitched on so many times. John and I sort of have enough respect for each other. We're like, look, if one of us thinks it's funny, let's try it. You know, you have a table read, you have an animatic, you have a color, or you, you know, you get on the stage and an actor says that it's going to work or it's not going to work. So we tend to both go, look, if you feel strongly about something, you think it's funny, let's give it a shot. There've been times we both, you know, dig in, but you know, it, it's rare. And and we've been writing together forever. Where it's it's like a marriage. You know, it, it actually prepared me to be, I think, a better husband to my wife because I, you know, had a writing partner all those years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just, you know, and look, there's plenty of times where the line you wanted to hear of yours never gets read, so you never know whether it'd work or not. Mm -hmm. But look, I fought for lines before that have died at the table too. So you know, it's you know you're going to sort of come out even some way or, or the other. Now you, yeah. you mentioned you just mentioned the King of the Hill guys as well as how they do it. Let me ask you this: You were working both on Blaze of Glory and King of the Hill at the same time. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. You know, obviously one of the advantages of being in a team is you can split duties. <laughs> and you know, we'd been running King of the Hill for a little while. We we sort of kind of knew what we were doing there. And yeah, and, and we always like to do a bunch of different things. We always have several projects going. It's kind of nice to bounce around, use a different part of your brain. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so doing the rewrite and doing King of the Hill really wasn't, look, it's a lot of work. It's not easy, but it wasn't, you know, impossible for us. Now, now you, you were there, for, you mentioned this earlier, you may have answered this, but you were there, were you there doing for the production for the rewrites or was your job done out then you signed off right after that or you were there for the shooting? Well, how did that go? Yeah, it's, I didn't say it's kind of interesting, but maybe it isn't, but who cares? We're here, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we had, so we, after we did the table read, the movie got greenlit. Yay, great, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Three days later, Ben says, you know what? I don't want to do the movie. It feels too much like a role I've already done before. I think dodgeball, maybe some other things. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the movie was no longer green lit. But like a week later, I guess Ben had reached out to Will and said, hey, I think you should do this movie. Will jumped in and it got green lit again. So that was great. And then, but yeah, we we did get a call down the road and, and it was to come in and do a writer's round table. I don't know if you guys know about those, but 
basically it's almost like a rewrite you would do in TV, except it's a movie rewrite. And we'd done some, we'd done on, one on Tropic Thunder and we'd done one with Sasha Baron Cohen on The Dictator. And I guess those were after Blade Lord, but you know, stuff we had done before and we were running King of the Hill. And it was like, look, we can't, we can't make that round table. And I go, what about this one? And we're like, now look, we're just crushed. We can't do it. And they kept asking us and we was like, look, we're sorry. And finally there, I guess it came out. It's like, look, we really need you guys. The studio wants that old Schuler Krinsky magic that they had lost from getting it rewritten so many times and they weren't going to make it again, which was a nice position to be in because as a writer to be able to, you know, get the weekly rewrite gig is a, is a good one. Yeah. Um, so that actually, so we actually came in and rewrote it uh, again got it back on track and they actually did it one more time. We had to come back in. They called us in to do like another week to, to do it. So then when it went into production, it got shut down because John Heater broke his ankle and it looked like it was going to die, but they, fortunately they kept going, but no, we were not on set. I believe Will has a guy that he likes to have on set and Will certainly, you know, can do a lot himself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've, we were not on set for that, which I, I don't enjoy being on set, even on my own shows. Like to me, it's, it's just dull. Like if you have a job to do, it's great. And when I'm running a show, there's enough to do that it's interesting. But I was a PA for far too long and sitting around on a set's just not um, my idea of fun. Well, the the uh I heard that the ending was changed pretty dramatically from like a uh uh a kidnapping up in the mountains that involved like going down the down the mountain and every Olympic other every other Olympic thing other than figure skating was involved in the escape. Were were, uh, were you a part of that rewrite, or did that happen like real time, just because of production? No, no, that was that was us, and and that is something I, I think John and I are both pretty proud of. Um, yeah, we we sort of felt like the best third act would be a chase on the ice, but we also thought it would be really funny. And I remember we writing this in the script. It's like the the slowest chase ever filmed now takes place as they go to land on skates and, and run around. Um, so yeah, so that act three really was, was all us. And, and it is one of the things I think we're, we're probably most proud of. Ups to you on that. Cause yes, I was, uh, I was about four bongs in by the time that yeah. part hit and I was just, I fell off the futon. <laughs> I was, uh, it was incredible. They got stuck in the escalator going up. Oh, just like, waiting for each other. Well, Trish trying to walk on yeah. ice skate because that's yeah. so relatable. Like just uh, met, uh, trying to imagine a chase on those things. <laughs> yeah. And look, uh, you know, uh, Speck and Gordon shot it amazingly. You know, when you write the screenplay, you tend not to write every single beat because nobody wants to read that. And we had a lot of detail in there, but they, you know, they, re when I saw it, the first time, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. It's, you know, when it's better than you pictured, that's, that's a great thing to happen. I mean, down to the editing, uh, I think is what, what really sealed the deal for me, because it's just the fact of like the high speed chase music kind of cutting off just long enough for you to hear the foley of the clinking and the chatter of the. Is is yeah, it's I mean from the writing, directing, acting, editing, it was a team effort to land that punchline and it worked. Yeah, that moment on the escalator where Will turns around to Will and is like, What are you supposed to be? And he's like, JFK, <laughs> don't worry, it'll make sense. It's like such a quiet, slow ride. It's yeah, I, I really like that moment. We read that the Van Waldenberg name was taken from the family name of one of the writers. Are you able to confirm that? I cannot. It might have been the Cox brothers. Um okay. We, uh, you know, it's funny because a lot of writers change the character names because I think they figure it'll help them get credit in the arbitration. Uh, we tend not to change names. So I don't recall changing that name, but certainly no one in, in my family or John's family or Von Waldenberg's. I, I don't know about you, but coming up with names is my least favorite part of the writing process. It just seems like such a tedious task. And if it's Bruce, John, Mary, like it's it's so difficult to come up with a name that people don't scoff at. Like, really? You couldn't have thought of something more creative? Yeah, I think John's very good at it, fortunately, because I'm not that good either. But at King of the Hill, you would spend, you know, you could spend a half hour or, or longer arguing over the name. I remember Johnny Hardwick, who played Dale in King of the Hill, but was also one of the writers really wanted Bill Dotrieve's middle name to be Anus. And he's like, E-N-N-I-S, Anus. And we're like, no. And But he wouldn't stop like 45 minutes. Like, Bill Anus Dotrieve. It's like, sorry, John. I mean, you got John Redcorn in there, so you got a little, you know. That's true. John Redcorn was a great, great character. He was fun. Yes, he was. Um, a lot of women. 
when you're uh, when you're writing, do you imagine certain actors for the characters in your stories to use a sort of an anchor point or reference? And if so, did you imagine anybody in particular writing the uh, or or when you I guess when you were rewriting the Chaz and Jimmy characters? I would say in general, no. I think a trap that that we fell into early on, and and probably other young writers do as well, is a lot of people will picture like Tom Hanks saying the line, and it sounds great because you're picturing Tom Hanks say the line. The line's not that great. Tom yeah. Hanks saying it's great. So I try not to picture an actor because I do think it's a crutch that's not helpful. But Blades of Glory, you know, initially we we're writing it for Ben and then rewriting for Will. You know, obviously you picture them and and you know there's certain things they're going to be able to to do well. I remember in the the courtroom scene, one of the lines we wrote and and just picturing Will saying was like, what he did was so beautiful, which is like you know I'm a sex addict. It's my cross to bear. It, it's a real disease. With uh, with doctors and medicine and everything, you know that's like you know picturing him say that and then see him deliver it that way is is very rewarding. Oh yeah, I could imagine. Yeah, great question line, man. Question line. Now let me ask you this: Was it planned always in the writing to cra- uh, to cast Craig T. Nelson for the character that would literally be named Coach? Oh, Actually, it? we already got the answer. It was going to be Alec Baldwin. Well, well, no. Well, th- yep, it was. So I, I guess that it, it was just interesting that Craig T. Nelson ended up yeah. being called. I, mean, I guess could, could that have been involved in the rewrites to to because he's literally credited on IMDb as coach. Coach, yeah. I, you know, I, I feel like one of those congressional witch, witnesses who's like, I don't recall. <laughs> but there'll be a lot of that. I'm like, I don't know. I don't. I I think we always called him coach even before it was Craig T. Nelson, but I could be wrong on that one. Okay, okay, I, I and that's one. fair. I mean, we we do a lot of '80s movies, so you're not the first person to say <laughs> I do not remember what I did on that bus for one hour in 1985. <laughs> no, I, I, I have an interesting one because me and you talked about this. So uh, we were going to talk about it. Uh, the who was this in you guys' original script or was it in the rewrites? The the move that they did actually came from a film. What what did we call it? What was the name of the film? Uh, the move that they did. Uh, oh, the Iron Lotus. I, yeah, yeah, the Iron Lotus. Yeah, but it was from a real film. That then I what, what the hell is the name of the film? We've talked about this. Oh, Cutting Edge. Thank you. Yes, Cutting Edge. So did was that a part of you guys' script to say that they were going to do that, or was that a part of the rewrites? So we and this is one that I yeah I, my memory's a little fuzzy. We came up with this idea that there was this crazy dangerous move mm-hmm. that had been banned that they were going to do. I cannot remember if we called it Iron Lotus or not. I kind of felt like we did, but yeah, I don't think I knew Cutting Edge. I mean, oh, I remember that movie, but I don't think that was part of our okay. Our okay. inspiration it's a move, though. It's a dangerous ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get right. your head locked off. All right. Now, on on IMDb, there's a piece of trivia. Again, loosely, this is IMDb that states that the writers claim that 88.773 of Will's Ferrell's dialogue is is improvised or changed in some way to suit suit his persona. Is that true? You're on the congressional stand here. <laughs> well, I'm not great at math. Um, uh, yeah, the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, you know, look, Will changes a lot to fit his, you know, his personality, what he can deliver. Um, and certainly there's plenty of lines I can remember us writing and him delivering in a different way. But there's a lot of lines, you know, when I went to the premiere, the first time I saw the movie, I was like, oh, that's not that's not ours. And there really weren't any writers between us in the movie other than whoever Will had on set. So I'm sure, you know, there's plenty of places where Will, you know, did well. And thank goodness he did. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. It's all right if you don't remember, we could move on to the next one. But is there anything that comes to mind as far as like in the script, there was a particular phrasing that you were like, uh, like you see it changed in the final product like oh man it was the the wording that i had was really good well this is a little more macro than that but it, it's kind of interesting the draft that we always delivered and and you know was right up until the shooting script starts at that orphanage if you remember jimmy gets adopted by by Wim Fickner's character well what you don't what we had written was that he was ready to adopt Chaz. Chaz was a kid at that orphanage. And then suddenly he sees Jimmy and he's like, no, I want him. And Chaz hated Jimmy from that moment in childhood. And throughout the movie, Chaz has this anger toward Jimmy that Jimmy is completely unaware of. And then it finally comes out. So when they shot it and when I saw it, I was like, that was missing. And it was kind of jarring to me. I'm like, how do you take that huge emotional element out of it? But look at where the audience loved it. And years later, you know, I watched it recently to, to, to try to remember some things for this. Uh, I was like, yeah, I mean, it works without it. Look, that's a layer that we always thought was interesting. 
But that was a decision made at some point. And honestly, I don't know whether it was edited out or they never shot it, but um, that was really the main thing that I was like, wow, that's different. I mean, I love that because it makes sense with the film now because we never, I can see why Jimmy got into figure skating, but now I feel like the reason why Chaz got into it because he was like, no matter what he's going to do, I'm going to show his dad he should have adopted me. I'm going to be better than him no matter what he does. Yeah. I get you. Uh, I was going to, I feel like I've seen that as a deleted scene or maybe just heard about it on the commentary, but that rings a bell, What what that, that scene that you described. Yeah, so, you know, I can picture it too, but once again, I don't know whether I actually, I actually saw it or it's just, you know, when we wrote it, I yeah. saw it. I'm, I'm gonna, can't wait to rewatch that again. Now, uh, you, do you um, do you have a claim to fame with Blaze of Glory? Like, you want to watch it? Like, I wrote that part. That was my idea. Like, when oh, you watch it. Yeah. We, but actually, the other day, but it got, we don't know what happened to it. Uh, well, no, other than the other than the slow speed chase at yeah. the end. Uh, well, no, he can give uh, us a slow speed chase. No, I think that answers that. You did give us a slow speed. Chase. No, I got more to say about it. Oh, go, go for it. Go, ahead, go yes. for it. Because, yeah, look, it's 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 very heady when you first see lines you've written, you know, appear on TV or in movies. So in Blades of Glory was such a big hit mm-hmm. and people remember it. So there are certain lines. And, and the one I just one one that I remember is that when uh, Chaz is like, you know, it's mind bottling. Mind bottling, isn't it? Did you just say mind bottling? Yeah, mind bottling. <laughs> like mind bottling. Yeah, you know what they and I came up with that line because my mom used to say it. She goes, Oh, it's mind bottling. I'm like, what did you say? She was mind bottling. I'm like, no, it's mind boggling. But she thought it was mind bottling. So I just went to see Will Farrell say that what I heard my mom say was definitely very uh That's very awesome. Boring. And I think my kids know too, the other line that I always really liked is when they're they're going into the bedroom and when they're gonna room together and Will's like, uh, the night's a very dark time for me. It's dark for everyone, moron. Not for Alaskans or dudes with night vision goggles. All right, this is going to stop right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not for Alaskans or guys with infrared goggles, which is another line I remember, you know, we wrote and I was like, oh, that neck came just as we wrote it. And that, that was fun. The, the mind bottling line was, um, it, is your mom still around or was she, uh, was she around at the time to? She, she was, she did get to see it and, uh, you know, I think she had very mixed emotions. Like, you're making fun of me, but Will Ferrell just said one of my lines. So that's, I was yeah. say, that's the beautiful part about being a writer and an actor. Your work lives on in infamy. Like, you can put people into these stories and name them things. And they're, they're I'm not forever. sure that's how I, I mean, wanted to be immortalized, but I, take it. I am. I I'll am. Take it. Yeah, that's awesome, this, though. This may be you guys being immortalized right here. And he's out. Right. So. Oh, oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> When uh, when you're working on a movie like this, it's so heavily saturated in a particular culture like figure skating. What kind of preparation or research do you practice like to get yourself into that world? And like, what is it like walking that line between authenticity and comedy? Yeah, we definitely do a lot of research and did a lot of research. I mean, I wasn't a huge figure skating fan. So uh, John and I both, you know, did a lot of research like the the hug and cry area or the kiss hug and cry i think it was called um like that was something was like oh we didn't know that existed that's really cool you know but the authenticity really feels like it never gets in the way of the comedy i mean sometimes it does like you don't want to go to the letter of the law if it's not funny but usually anything that's real is is inspiring in a comedic way so almost everything we learned about figure skating whether it made it on the screen or not we would really try to employ in the screenplay yeah, I thought like my experience with figure skating has always been just accidentally catching it on television at my grandmother's house in the 90s. So it's like it's this vague memory. And I think that's what's really cool about Blades of Glory is I think most people's experience with figure skating is something similar to that. And Blades of Glory touches on all those highlights that stand out in your memories when you. Yeah, was that time your hard news? I mean, a lot of people <laughs> just throwing it out there. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Cool, yeah. She was, she was, she, okay, got, all right. she got done dirty. She did. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, as, um, as writers, we often inject our aspects, at least of our personalities into the characters that we create in Blades of Glory. Who would you say draws the biggest inf- influence from aspects of your personality? Well, I'm not a sex addict. Um, <laughs> and I'm not a hygiene freak. Um, you know, certainly you can't help but inject yourself in certain characters, certain things. And I thought about this, you know, I don't think this is one of them, you know, and maybe it's just because we've been doing this so long that it becomes a craft where you're, you know, really just writing the characters and, and it doesn't have you in it. But yeah, I don't think there's a ton of, of me other than maybe being a smart ass, you know, and, and some of, you know, some of those lines, but personality wise now, I mean, I'm probably closer to, to uh, Jimmy's character than, than Chaz's, but nothing I can really think of specifically. 
And there will always be a hint of your mom in chess. <laughs> That's right. Always. <laughs> always. Now, earlier you talked about one of your favorite scenes, of course, being when they, they get stuck in the escalator. But I want to ask you this. And again, whether it's in front of the camera, as far as the lines you wrote that are being portrayed or just with the people you work with, um, do you have a favorite memory from your time working on Blades of Glory? Um, I would say the, you know, really that just the writing process um, was fun. Uh, it was, a, like I said, a great idea. and. Um, and we were able to come in and execute our vision of it. It was really fulfilling. So, you know, not being on set, which maybe for some people would have been the highlight. We went to visit set and got to hang out a little bit. But, you know, just that writing process and, and honestly the table read to see, you know, these great actors reading it is is what stands out to me. Uh, yeah. And 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 it all beginning with walking onto the set of Tenacious D and the Pick of Destiny. That's got to be a, that's an awesome origin story. Yeah. <laughs> Um, before we move on from Blades of Glory, is there anything else that you'd like to share you think fans of the film would like to know? I don't know if they'd like to know this, but it's another little bit of trivia, which uh, I think only I found interesting because Ben didn't. But, um, <laughs> you know, we met with Ben over at his house when we first were going to do the start the rewrite. And as we're walking out, I told him, I go, look, you know, this was the first time we had met other than the, the you know, pitching. I go there. We have sort of a connection. The you know, he did the movie. There's something about Mary where he's wearing that horrible brown tuxedo and he gets his, you know, his <gasps> caught in the, in the zipper. Well, my girlfriend from high school, who I went to prom with is a very successful costume designer. Her name's Mary Zofri. She's done all the Coen brothers movies and work with her, but she did that movie. So when it became time to design a horrible tacky tux for this eighties prom, she just took out a picture of our, our prom date and built <laughs> my, I wore that horrible two-tone brown tuxedo to prom, I didn't have the accident that uh, that Ben. Some beans, some beans. Yeah. That's, yeah. Wow, so that's. But as we're uh, working out, I told Ben, I go, look, yeah, that was my tuxedo, whatever, and he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> no, that is interesting. I mean, I mean, don't take this the wrong way, but I don't want to ruin with you room inside joke. But you remember that one? No. He told he told that to someone. It's been a while since. Oh, I but he said that story Mary. definitely did happen. That's uh, and that that's that's kind of insulting, right? You know, maybe he just wanted us out of his house. You know, he probably was. Oh thinking, no, I'm talking about the fact that you're the 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 uh, the girl you went to prom with. Like, hey, I need a terrible oh. tuxedo. What can I draw back on from personal experience? Oh yeah, Krinsky. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I think even like a few years after that prom, I asked my buddies. I was like, why didn't anybody say anything? And they're like, yeah, you seemed happy, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but they did a story. I remember like when the movie came out at the channel or somebody did a, a, a story on her and she goes, yeah, the tux is actually my prom date. And she holds up a picture from our prom with her cut out. So it's just <laughs> me, not her and her dress. It's just me and my stupid tuxedo. The question so. is, did she cut it out before the interview or had it been cut out years before that? Oh, I deserve either or both. Oh, my God. All right, we'll get this thing back on track with Extra. <laughs> Released in 2009, working with Mike Judge again. The legend Wikipedia says that you co-wrote Extract, but IMDb just lists you as an executive executive producer. Can you co elaborate on that, sir, please? Yeah, I was not a, a co-writer really, in, okay. in nominally or whatever. You know, Mike and John and I just always worked together, and he had written, um, you know, a partial script for Extract, and he was trying to figure out what movie he wanted to do next. He was like, "Oh, you guys look at this," and John and I go, "This is great. You know, this is such a cool character's cool idea." Um, and we would just go with him to the Sportsman's Lodge, which is this hotel in, in Studio City. And we'd sit in a suite, you know, all day, just sort of pitching ideas and sort of just helping him, you know, you know, figure out certain things. Like John had the idea, of, I think, of the, the sort of company in in danger, bankruptcy and that being a, a you know, thing. But Mike, you know, wrote it, you know, so we. This is the brainstorming. Yeah, we were brainstorming, but it's yeah, it's it's Mike's movie. Um, Office Space is a classic. It's easily one of our favorite movies combined. Um, people finally caught on to Idiocracy. It seems like extract of like the, the Mike Judge trilogy out there. It doesn't get nearly all the credit that it deserves. But what do you think is the reason why Office Space became this culturally significant thing? And extract, which I consider to be an equally great film, it swims in similar waters of like the middle class working experience. It didn't make as big of a splash. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, you know, Mike's material is, is you know, it's offbeat. I, I remember, I think at South by Southwest, they were doing, you know, some tribute to him. And, 
we were they were talking about doing a, a sizzle reel about his greatest moments. And I was like, you know, it really should be three things. It should be Beavis and Butthead laughing, Hank saying, yep. And uh, Gary Cole's character going, yeah. And there's so much humor just in those little things. So, look, I remember when I first saw Office Space and like it was Mike. So I so I liked it. But I was also a, a little bit like, oh, wait, this wasn't what I was expecting. Having seen Beavis and Butthead, you know, you expect something else. So I think that maybe was part of it. I think Office Space did catch on because like it's a great movie and it's so relatable. It doesn't matter where you work. If as, you've soon, ever worked. as soon as I saw the contempt for the doorknob, <laughs> five minutes in, I'm like, oh, this movie nails the little things. This is going to be great. This, yeah. But, like, X, I was, but Extract does the same thing. I mean, it, it 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 pins on all those, the like the little things you could only really get unless you spent time in a place like that. Yeah, I think Extract's, you know, well, I mean, it shared his other, with his other movie. In fact, it wasn't marketed well. I mean, the... The studio decided, oh, we got to go after the Beavis and Butthead crowd when this is a movie about a guy having a midlife crisis and going to extremes. Yeah. Um, if I had to say, I would say that maybe a workplace comedy is more relatable than a guy, you know, having a midlife crisis, hiring a gigolo to fuck his wife. Sure. Yeah. But it's a that. great, I mean, the characters, the performance, I love Ben Affleck in that movie and Jason Bateman's great. I don't know. Uh, Dustin is great. They're all so good. So it's a shame that more people haven't seen it because I do think it's a great movie. And as much as I love Ron Livingston and he's perfect as Peter in Office Space, I, I'd like to imagine what Office Space would have been like with Jason Bateman doing the same exact line, oh. same exact delivery. Like It would have been great on a whole, in a whole different way. Yeah. Um, you uh, you co-wrote another film that doesn't get nearly enough love, Action Point, was released in 2018, and I thought this was the perfect vehicle to naturally integrate what Johnny Knoxville is great at, being a insane jackass and taking those antics into a narrative feature. I was curious, uh, was your script originally written for Johnny Knoxville with that jackass angle, or had it or did it morph into that after he was casted? No, I mean, first of well, all, you encapsulated really what the pitch was. Like this was a great segue. And idea was for Johnny to yeah go just from doing st those stupid stunts to a narrative with those stupid stunts and and uh, but no it was, you know Johnny and and his producing partner Derek Frieda came to us with the idea they had wanted to do it they saw it exactly as you saw it and we loved it from the get we loved Johnny he's a great guy mm -hmm. um, so yeah so we all developed it and and you know developed it together and then John and I went off and and wrote the screenplay. Um, yeah, that one, you know, it's it's tricky. I think the main problem, there's a couple of main problems. I think one of the problems with people who watch a narrative movie, a fiction movie, know what CGI is. They know what stunt doubles are. So the fact that Johnny did all his stunts was kind of a gray area. Like to us, we were, and he was like, I'm doing every stunt. I've got to be able to do it. That's what this movie's about. And he went on all the talk shows talking about it. But I think it just gets lost in translation the tiniest bit because people are just like, oh, yeah, he flew out of this or whatever. I've seen that before. Yeah, um, that's a shame. Yeah. Like, it could have been marketed, like, just heavily on that. Like, watch Johnny Knoxville do these stunts for real. Action point. Like, or, or something like that. I'm not a fucking marketer. I don't know. But, you know, to really capitalize on the fact that when you see this movie, you're going to see real stunts performed by the actor. And, and if I'm not mistaken, now Action Point was actually is, is based on the infamous, infamous. I told you I was going to do this. We rehearsed this. Hey, we, we tried. Uh, word, not enough. With me, this is one yeah. word in the English uh, vocabulary I cannot. Fuck, we're gonna do this again. We're one, three, five, seven. I'm gonna power through this shit. Here we go. Three, two, one. Now Action Point is based on the infamous. Dangerous New Jersey amusement park, action park. Now you hold on, I'll do it again, but I'll, I'll say I'll say the word. You just, I'll come back. you just no, you just mouth it. I love it. <laughs> that, that's what she said. Three, two, one. Action point is based on the infamously dangerous New Jersey amusement park. Now action park. Now you were born and raised in Florida. Clearly, that's where we're at, which is essentially one big action park itself. But did you have any firsthand experience with when it came to be what what came to be known as class action park? <laughs> no, and I actually lived before I lived in Florida. I lived up there. I lived in, in Boston. I lived in New York. So I know a lot of people who who did go there. I just never, never went there. But yeah, that park was was the inspiration for it. And so many people, you know, have that red badge of courage, the broken arm or whatever they got there. And they, and they were cool for having it. And in all honesty, I think that ended up being a, another problem with the movie was the, the whole basis of the idea from the get go we all agreed on was 
this was a different time when personal responsibility was much more important and, and much more, you know, the, the state of being. And a place like Action Park or Action Point couldn't exist today. Look, those times probably had to change, mm-hmm. but it's kind of sad that they did. And yeah. what bookended the movie and, and really was, was in the script, at least, and infused throughout it, was this idea of personal responsibility being slowly taken away. And the opening of the movie was always, you know, seeing, you know, this pickup truck with a bunch of kids riding in the back going over a bump and they go flying. That's what we all used to do. Florida, you guys probably did it too. Mm -hmm. And then you cut to like a teacher going, oh, we don't play tag. We play shadow tag so that nobody, you know, hurts one another. And, you know, then you see idiots throwing lawn dogs in there and hitting themselves. And then another, you know, new. So that was sort of the setup from the beginning of, boy, this was a crazy time. And it's kind of sad it's gone, but here it is. Yeah. I remember at the premiere, you know, the, the movie just didn't really work, to be honest. But at the premiere, there was one sort of segment, one line that was about that. And everybody cheered. Like, everybody was like, yes, that's so relatable. And look, I don't like to bash studios because that's too easy to do. But I think this was one where they, you know, they had wanted Johnny to do Bad Grandpa too, And so that's why they put the, the you know, the old grandpa in the beginning and the end. And um, they kind of hammered away, chiseled away at that. And they said, more stunts, more stunts. Um, so in a way, I think that movie became what Blades of Glory might have been without sort of grounding the characters and making it feel authentic. It really just became craziness and stunt after stunt. Yeah. I think that that heart of the story did come through those. I, I felt that there was like the antagonist of the movie wasn't really a person or it was just the idea of uh, things changing from the way they used to be to the way they are now. And that impending doom of that, like but we uh, growing up in Florida, we had, I don't know if you know, there's uh there's black, the plastic or the like hard plastic they they use them in the bottom of ditches to let the water run through their like, yeah. we found a bunch of those on a construction site uh one summer and fasten them all together about 40 feet up into a tree down into a lake held real shoddily by two by fours and a little bit of dish soap and a water hose uh, we called it the mahalo <laughs> Larry Walter. Welcome to Manson Water Park. Welcome to Manson Water Park. I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be fun for you. Go on down that water slide. Slide right on into the pool. That's what you hear here at this here crazy water park. We got a trampoline right in the middle of the pond if you want to jump off the trampoline and walk back into the pond. And you can walk right on up the riverbank, I mean pond bank, and go right back down the water slide again. That's what we do here at the number one water park in Sonic Jacksonville, Florida. And it was it was dangerous. So, yeah, we got into some like every, we every friends, right? yeah, <laughs> oh, we were. we were. I just I was nice enough not to invite you to oh. that. Like, <laughs> well, there's a I mean, there was this great creative anarchy back then. That's kind of like I have kids. Sounds like you have kids. I mean. My kids don't do any of that stuff, you know? They don't really have the opportunity to. And it's like, it was fun mayhem. And yeah, people got hurt, but it was sort of how you learn certain limits and, you know, I, how not to be a dumbass. some dirt on that. My daughter, yeah. my daughter is so cautious to a fault. And like, part of me, as as I, I'm a worrier too, I'm like, well, I, the good thing is, is I'm not going to have to worry so much about something crazy happening because she's reckless. But sometimes just like, God, you got to live. Like she'll, she'll walk 20 feet away from us and be turning around to make sure that we were there. I never turned around to make sure somebody was there. Like maybe eventually. And then be like, Oh shit, where did. (laughs) Well, John always talks about his kids. He's like, they'll ask him to do something. He's like, don't ask me to do that because I have to say no. Don't ask me. Just go (laughs) do it. You know, it's like none of our kids are, are wired that way. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, that's weird. We sound we sound like old. We sound old. Oh my God. Yeah, these damn kids <laughs> today. I don't understand them. Um, 
Silicon Valley. This is a series that is as highly regarded in the world of IT as office spaces in the world of cubicle employment. Uh, you created the series along with Mike Judge and John Ottschuller. Um, You're credited on writing the first episode, Minimum Viable Product. So this, uh, I was curious, when you begin writing something, how, how do you go about it when you know the task is not only to create a single episode that's good on its own, but you also have 30 minutes to lay the foundations for characters and set the environment uh, that can prove it's that it can sustain a shelf life beyond that. Yeah, that's a good question because obviously with a movie, you, you only have to sustain it for, for the 90 minutes. You have to have your beginning, middle and end. And, and with something like Silicon Valley, yeah, you, you need to make sure it can, it can live on. So I think when we're coming up with TV show ideas, that's sort of the main thing is like, what's the dynamic that, this show is about not just the pilot episode, but what's the show about? And the idea that that Thomas Middleton's character was going to be caught between these two giant forces of of you know these two characters and these these that wanted his his code, we sort of realized, wait a minute, this is a guy who's going to want to make his own way, make the right decision, hold on to what he can. So that's a dynamic that can play out, you know, for for seasons, which it did. So you know, look, the characters in dynamics have to be interesting enough and real enough so that people are going to relate to it over an extended period of time. Um, but like a lot of shows, like shows that kind of have a science fiction hook often don't survive past the first season. If they do, they just don't work because it's like, once you kind of figure out, oh, this is what it's about, there's kind of like no more mystery. So just the kind of human dynamic of creating something and wanting to hold on to it, I think is, is relatable, but also sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, and especially like now it's even it's more difficult with uh, pilots because there's so much content out there to choose from. Like people will go 10 minutes into an episode and they're going to decide in the 10 minutes into the pilot whether this is something that they're going to add to their list or or move on to something else. No, you're, you're 100% right. And it's, it's sort of become the way the business is run, I think, in, in a bad way because you're what used to you think, oh, we'll get to this in, by episode three. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, no, 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 shove it all in. So King of the Hill is a good example. You know, when Mike wrote the first pilot, the Super Newsome Bones weren't introduced. There was a lot of things that weren't introduced that by the time it got then like, oh no, you know, we move stuff out. You had the ability to move stuff out over a few episodes. So mm-hmm. yeah, nowadays they're like, no, no, you got to jam everything in. We don't want to lose people. And in a way it's, it doesn't make for the best storytelling takes away yeah. the term slow burn. He used to always tell me when you watch this, it's a slow burn. So I'm like, okay, the payoff is coming. And now that you don't get that anymore. So I definitely agree. Yeah. I think the show that's doing that best now is the show I told you about that slow burn with Ozark. Ozark like yes. that, that's, that show's taking chances because there are people who are like, I tried, I just couldn't <laughs> like, well, it would have been good if you did. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it comes together. Yeah. You are uh, you're most recently working on the animated series The Freak Brothers, starring a great cast. It's got Woody Harrelson, John Goodman, Pete Davidson, Tiffany. Haddish, and thank you. Yeah, Haddish, you uh, yes. Adam Dev- Adam Devine, Blake Anderson, yeah. Andrea Savage, and we see reuniting with familiar faces like Phil Lamar and Alan Friedland. Um, the Freak Brothers. It's available on the streaming platform Tubi, and we are curious from your perspective as a producer on the show who has created you've created. Uh, many major television series for ma- many major television networks and now working with the streaming platform. And this isn't just on Tubi. It's built as like a, a Tubi original. What advantages and disadvantages are there when comparing the two worlds? And do you foresee a future with uh, any recognizable hint of the traditional television platform? I don't know. I mean, I do feel like the traditional platform is, is disappearing and, and maybe it, it will survive. I know like my wife and I have been watching something on Hulu lately, and I guess we didn't pay enough to not have commercials. And we're sitting there watching commercials going, what is this? We haven't watched commercials in so long. Um, but I think as a, as a writer and as a creator, you know, I'd say many of the, the things in a creative process are the same, you know, you still have to come up with the same, you know, do the same work to create a show, but uh, you know the streamers have kind of taken over, and I think a little, even the network kind of imitate them a little bit. Um, I don't think it's for the best. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's become look, you know, Netflix. You walk in there, they have like I, it's so weird. You walk into their waiting room, and there's like thirty other people. It's like you know, a, almost a party. Be like you know everybody in there. It's like oh, you're pitching, you're pitching, you're pitching, and at the top of the hour. Everybody gets up, goes into their little 
conference room. There's like, I don't know how many of them, everybody pitches, everybody walks out, how did it go? How'd it go? You know, and it, it has a bit of an assembly line feel. Um, and look, it's not just because of the streamers, but you know, in the old days, there were guys like, and this is really going back. I didn't work in the, but like Grant Tinker, who was like, you know, Hey, that's a talented writer. Just work with them. Let's do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly it became networks wanting to get notes and whatever. And I mean, I've heard stories lately where people will write a spec script for TV, bring it into somewhere like Netflix. And they're like, eh, we don't read scripts because then we don't get a chance to develop. We want to develop, you know? So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I just sound like a bitter old. Uh, I don't know. In the old days, things were better. I mean, they always talk <laughs> in different ways. I'm so interested in that lobby. I would have just, I would have loved to see the, what the response would have been. It's like, all right, how many of you have a murder mystery documentary idea? <laughs> Can you imagine like walking in? 77% of the hands. Walking in with dog day afternoon, and they're like, you know what? I really want to, I want to animate it. I want to animate it. I, just, I, I mean, that's really, really fucking I, I feel like the overhead for streaming platforms is is less than television networks to try an idea. So uh, is there more of a, um, uh, not freedom, I guess, but I guess more of a, a more risks taken with ideas? Like, are you, are, do they, do they, is the leash looser? Yeah, I guess in some ways. I mean, um, certainly network TV has, you know, certain restraints and constraints and, and just what you can say and do. And I've seen stuff on the streamers. I was like, holy shit. That's like, wow, I haven't seen that on TV before. <laughs> um, so in, in a way that's good, but I don't think, you know, except maybe for a handful of proven commodities, I don't think there's a ton of creative freedom coming from those places. I think. Uh, Everybody is all these executives have grown up within the executive class and they think their job is to give notes. There's very few execs I've met in my career who are like, I don't have any notes. You know, I think they feel like they're not doing their job if they don't. Oh, God's among men. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I, I heard a story from some writers I'm very close with and they're they're like A-list writers. They run some very and create some very popular shows. And, you know, right before the pandemic, during the pandemic, things were kind of slow and I think it's, I'll drop names here because what I heard about them so hard, I think it's Voodoo maybe is doing some streaming stuff and they had some extremely low budget show. They weren't paying anything. And these guys just happened to have a window between seasons where they were available. And I remember I put them up for it and they're like, yeah, look, it's not really worth this, but we'll do it. We want to get out of the house. We'll do it. They got called in twice and were grilled by executives who have never done anything. I don't know what Voodoo's done, but they just like, tore them apart. They were disrespectful. They were just, you know, and these guys were like, what? You know, I mean, how could they do that to JJ Abrams? That is yeah. downright. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to drop the name. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I, I respect that. That's it's like, yeah. That's like we talk about with the uh, Tropic Thunder. We make fun of Bill Hader's character when he was like, we are getting this in a wide shot. Of course I'm going to give him the fucking wide shot. Like they know what they're doing. Like let them do it. Like yeah. that, that just freaks me out. <sighs> let, let me ask you this. If I'm not mistaken. It's the business card. They get the business card and it goes to their head. You see what I came in today? Yeah. I got it. I got it. My pick. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you this. Now, early in the interview, you said you wanted to be a writer since you were 12, correct? Correct. There are a bunch of 12 year olds and adolescents and people younger than 12. If you were to give them advice, about for the aspiring writers out there, what's the most important thing that they should know? Well, I think the best I can do are the cliches that we've probably heard because they are true. It's like you've got to you've got to write, you've got to write constantly, you've got to read a lot, and you've got to write. And look, I came out here with a bunch of guys from Carolina, and they've all actually done pretty well. But there's plenty of people come out who want to be writers and they don't write. You know, they they get a job on a production crew, they make good money and they buy a nice car and they move to Santa Monica and then they keep working to keep paying and writing's hard, you know, and it's not fun all the time. So, you know, if you really want to write, you've got to write. Um, and I guess the other thing is to, is to be authentic. And it, and it sounds like an easy, I've heard that all my life. Yeah. Okay. I'll be authentic. I'll be real, but it's a hard thing to do. I think our generation, I'm older than you guys, but you know, we were all kind of raised on TV and so when you start telling stories, so many times you're telling stories, versions of stuff you've seen on TV, not yeah. something that's from real life. So that feels very canned, feels very familiar, doesn't feel honest. So you really have to work and kind of having your radar up within yourself and outside yourself to write something that's true um, and unique. You know, like on King of the Hill, John always said, look, we're not going to do an episode about book burning unless we find some way to say it's a good thing. Because anybody can do an episode about 
book burning is bad, homelessness is bad, whatever. It's how do you turn something on its side and do it in a way we haven't seen before. Yeah. Um, so I think you just have to be very conscientious. And you also can't, like, it's the Tom Hanks thing. You can't just say, well, this is good as stuff that's been on TV, because that's not what people are looking for. If, they, if you're trying to break in, especially now, you've got to write something that's unique and sings, not just is as good as what's out there. I can speak to that because one thing he's talking about in King of the Hill, I don't know if you remember this, he'll remember this. I was the first time I found it funny that it, it wasn't it wasn't being pro-Christian. It was like being like an R-rated Christian. It was, I'm paraphrasing it, but it was like, fuck the devil. Or it was just saying stuff that people, should, Christians shouldn't say this word, but you're still shaming the devil. So like the devil sucks or something like that. Bobby wore shirts like that. So it was that no, type you- of comment. That's fine. That's the exact episode I was going to reference when, when what I was talking about. Yeah. He's a genius. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. Thank you. That was one of one of my favorite episodes. It was a- infamously from- so. <laughs> infamously so, yes. Um, that episode was all about Bobby starts hanging out with some skater punks who are punks for Jesus. And so Bobby wants to get a tattoo and he wants to get an earring, but he wants to get a cross. And Hank is like, I don't know what to make of this. So that's the kind of episode I, I mean, you're not going to see that anywhere else on TV. And honestly, we had, you know, Christian, you know, ministers, pastors, whatever, writing us saying, hey, I want to use this episode to show to the kids in my congregation, because, you know, at the end of the episode, Hank is like, you know, Hank's saying, no, you're not getting a tattoo. You're not hanging out with them. And Bobby's like, you don't love Jesus. And at the end, Hank takes out this box that has like beanie babies and whatever in it. He goes, this is all the stuff you used to be passionate about and, and ended up in this box in the garage. I don't want that to happen to Jesus. And it, was like, it was funny, but it was touching. It was respectful of religion because the characters are religious and, you know, but that was a very unusual way to tell that story um, that you really wouldn't see anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> Look at us dropping knowledge on you, man. Thank you. That's, that's what we do. Now, <laughs> this this won't be a cliche answer because it can be personal to you. What is your go-to comedy film? Not as a writer, just as a fan of film. That's tough. I mean, I would probably say, I'm not going to say one, but Raising Arizona, anything the Coen brothers do tends to work for me. And Monty Python, not the Holy Grail. Every time I sit down uh, and watch it, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't know about this movie. You watch Bitch and Pieces. But the meaning of life and life of Brian to me are, I can pick those up and if it's on, I'm going to sit there and, and watch it. And it's the kind of movie you can dip in and out of, which is nice. You only catch 10 minutes of. So let's say that cluster. I think the uh, the diaper heist is the greatest seven minutes of television or of, of cinema ever put down. Like the music, the, the facial expressions, Nicolas Cage just is so, the cops were the best part of that scene to me, the way they're just recklessly shooting through the fucking grocery store. Yeah, right, exactly. And then like everybody's so gun happy all of a sudden. And then the guy who owns the grocery store comes out with a shotgun and blow starts blowing through the chips. Oh, was so such a great movie. Oh yeah. man. Yeah, that's definitely up there. Oh, Cohen Brothers all together. Oh, well, you know how I feel about them, even though I'm store for another day uh besides listen besides the freak brothers is there anything that you can speak on non-nda related about that you can let the audience know about that you're working on yeah the next thing you will have the opportunity to to see is um john and i co-wrote a book with uh an actor by the name of richie stevens um he is a is a character actor who is a recovered alcoholic and drug addict and gangster and he came to us and he was actually pitching a friend of his story and I'm like, yeah, yeah. But he'd say, well, you know, then I, he's Irish. He goes, then I moved to the States because the cocaine's much better. And I joined an Asian gang, you know, he's this tall white blonde guy. And we're like, wow, you have a fascinating story. And in all honesty, we thought, wow, this should make a good TV show. But we thought with the state of the business, everything, if we have it as an underlying EP as a uh, IP, as a book, that would be great. So we ended up selling it as a book. It comes out May 24th. It's called The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety. Um, go out and buy several copies. So that, that's a that's a novel? No, it's it's nonfiction. It's basically uh, it's a memoir of Richie's life. And, you know, John had the idea. He's like, it's like, Richie, you went through the 12 steps, right? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, well, let's tell your life story in 12 steps. So you know, step one is, I think it made you have a problem. Well, we tell the path that Richie was on when he first started drinking, why he's drinking and, and all that. And then ultimately when he hit rock bottom and realized he needed help. So each step 
kind of is entertaining because he had a very florid, entertaining life that, you know, was between Europe and the U S and Australia. Um, but he also was a terribly sweet guy who, who came out the other side and look, he'll tell you, he goes, look, he's not trying to tell anybody how to do it. He's just saying, this is what worked for me. And maybe, it, you know, maybe you'll learn something from it. So is there a comedy angle to, to the, uh, to the book? Yeah, you know, look, John and I, people will ask as well, is this comedy? You know, because we pitch some very, some serious stuff too. Um, but it's yeah, like. That's why I asked. Cause I, the, you said like you, your original aspiration was to be like a, seri- a serious novelist. So it's, it's cool that we're at the last question and, and it's and, come full circle in a way. Yeah, but I think, you know, everything we do, because we do some dramatic stuff, it has comedy in it. And, and I'm not putting us in, in the same league with Scorsese, but, you know, he does very real gritty stuff but it's funny because real life is funny mm-hmm. so look richie's journey is funny in many ways his self-awareness is is funny in many ways um at its core you know it's a serious story about a guy who you know at, at one point he's ready to kill himself and he realized he had to you know get help and he does he did and he came out the other side so it's inspirational but there's a lot of very funny stuff you know in his may, story. 24? may 24th Awesome. awesome. I will uh I will be sure to put any corresponding information or anything that I, I can grab or if you want to send me, I'll I'll put it in the uh the description as well. Before we say goodbye, are there any parting words you would like to say to the audience? It could be a quote, it can be anything, it would just you you talking to the world right now. Uh I don't really have a quote, but I really love what these guys are doing. They are movie geeks in the best possible way. They love movies and they love movies for the right reasons. So please support them and keep watching. Love awesome. it. Man, I love this, Thank man. you very much. Maybe one day we can afford to let him write an episode for us. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. We're, we're, we're trying. Like, we're at try. least come in on the rewrite. There, oh, there <laughs> we go. <laughs> yeah. hey, I'm just going to put infamously all throughout it. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and if I'm not mistaken, now, Action Point was actually, it's, it's based on the infamously. Infamous, infamous, <laughs> I told you I was going to do this. We rehearsed this. <laughs> we tried. Uh, not word, enough. with me. This is one yeah. word in the English co- uh, co- uh, vocabulary I cannot. Fuck, we're going to do this again. We're going to one, three, five, seven. I'm going to power through this shit. Here we go. Three, two, one. Now, Action Point is based on the infamously dangerous New Jersey amusement park. Action Park. Now, you. Hold on. I'll do it again, but I'll, I'll say I'll say the word. You just, come you just No, you just mouth it. I love it. That, <laughs> that's what she said. Three, two, one. Action Point is based on the infamously dangerous New Jersey amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, Dave, for coming on. We really appreciate it, and a great work with Blades of Glory and everything else that we've talked about. And we'll look forward to the to, to the, the book, book on well. May twenty fourth. I got to read. It. Yeah, I got to get. It. I'll be on Amazon. <laughs> thank, well, you. thank you, guys. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Have a safe night. We'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Take care, sir.